first of all, thank you very much, Catherine. This is, I mean, I've been really excited. Uh, to, I'm really excited to take part in, in this event. And I've been, since you, you mentioned this to me, I've been thinking for, for the last two months, like, what am I going to say to, to future, to, to the young people that want to join the built environment industry? Because I'm, just to give you a bit of background, I'm, I, my background is an architect. I studied architecture in Spain and then I worked in practice as an architect. I also did things on buildings through Bain, working on looking at building pathology of buildings. Uh, then I moved on to doing energy assessment of buildings, um, moved to academia to share my knowledge in academia, teaching at the beginning things on in construction materials, lightweight construction, and then things on sustainability, as I also did my, my PhD in sustainable architecture. So really, really excited to be here again and to take part in this, in this event. And um, I think I couldn't agree more with, um, with the previous speaker, with Sima, when she said how exciting it is to take part in the construction industry. We have a great power because we build things that are going to be there and we will see some examples even for centuries. And I get this quote from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. So let's see that it's not the power that we have of changing cities, changing uh, buildings, but also that comes with a, with a responsibility because in the end we have to make buildings uh, and cities sustainable. So they, because they'll outlive ourselves, they'll be there. I think Sima said that the average building in the UK is around uh, 103 years old. So our buildings will outlive us. And uh, that's a great responsibility because they will be there for future generations. So my, my presentation is around how can we make our cities and therefore our buildings more sustainable and the importance of the built environment in tackling climate change. Um, I like bringing this, this slide because I, I'm sure that you are all familiar with climate change and its effects. So here I bring some, some photos of the effects of climate change. Things that we are seeing more and more often, floods, droughts, even um, cities really getting really getting totally frozen, uh, such as Chicago some years ago. So these things, why are these things happening? I mean, if, if you see those graphs below, you the first one is about CO2 levels and the, hist the highest historical CO2 level in all our history, it's been around 300 parts per million ppm, that's the, 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 the unit. And since 1950, it's, it has skyrocketed. And I think the last reading I heard the other day was around 120 something, 130 something, uh, no, sorry, 430 something, 400, something, right. something around those lines, but over 400 was the last CO2 reading, which is quite a lot, considering the, that the highest historical CO2 level has been 300. And that's been, you can see the graph since uh, 1950, it just like skyrocketed. And at the same time, we also um, uh, monitor the trends of uh, temperatures, average of temperatures every year. And since we, we have records from 80, 1880, and since then, the average temperature has increased by 1.5 degrees. And scientists, uh, scientists say that we cannot uh, go over two degrees over the baseline in 1880 because maybe we at, at that time will be in a point of no return. So that's why and um, we have a great responsibility. We all have to work together to tackle the effects of climate change and to bring the temperatures down. Yeah, we see a graph since uh, the last years, you can see from 1880 to 2018, I think it is, how the, the, our, our planet is, is warming and is partly consequence of the greenhouse 
uh, gases. So let's be positive because we want you to be uh, proactive and empower yourselves to, to tell you how great and the impact that you can have if you join the built environment team, if you choose a, a job, a career in the built environment. So let's give some, some numbers, some figures. Cities are responsible of 70% of global energy consumption and CO2 emissions. That's a lot, 70%. And buildings generate around 40% of annual global greenhouse uh, gases. So as you can see, the built environment cities, buildings have a considerable impact in, in terms of global warming and CO2 emissions. And maybe you've heard, some of you heard this concept of zero carbon buildings. What are zero carbon buildings? These are buildings that um, when the amount of CO2 emissions of those buildings released is zero or negative. And the thing is, now there is an agreement, a pledge that every building in the world needs to be net zero carbon by 2050 so we can keep the global temperatures be below two degrees. And part of, um, part of those countries is, is the UK. The UK has set in, in, the, in the regulation that um, we have to meet net zero carbon targets by 2050. That's our pledge as well. And, uh, and the thing is, as Sima said before, the average house in the UK is around 103 years old. Around two thirds of the building area that exists, exists today will be still standing in 2050. And, the, and at the moment, the building regulations affect only around 1%, 1 2%, 3% the most of the building stock annually. So even if we make the buildings net zero carbon from now on, and soon we are going to have the um, future home standard in 2025 to make all the buildings from, from that point net zero carbon, what happens with the buildings, with existing buildings, with very, very old buildings that are, um, the energy performance is really, really poor. What are we doing with that? And also to continue with the importance and the impact of the built environment, if you see these graphs, these are uh, the, the CO2 emissions uh, in 2017. Heating is the main source, followed by transport. Agriculture has also a huge impact. So if we want to meet the zero carbon targets in 2050, this is, um, we, we, um, we have to reduce quite a lot, in particular heating homes and electricity, also transport. Transport is, is going to be an, an, an important element as well to achieve net zero carbon targets by 2050, but buildings as well, as we have to bring down the CO2 emissions from heating and, and powering our buildings. And then we have other side effects, other side effects of building cities. Now, most of the uh, population in the earth, most of the population live in cities. So we are concentrating people in cities and, um, and that has some side effects. One is the heat island effect, which is when the city experiences much warmer temperatures than nearby rural areas. This image here is from Birmingham, but uh, I mean, if any of you lives in London, we and, and you look the weather forecast in London, it's always like between two, three degrees warmer than nearby rural areas. And that's because of the heat island effect. When we have, um, we have, we don't have lots of parks, for example, and there, is lo there are lots of tarmac, and materials that are absorbing the, the, the sun during the day and they release that uh, at night. So in, we are warming cities and that causes overheating in cities, which can be also a problem with warming temperatures. Be aware that in the UK, 
We don't have lots of air conditioning units, different to other parts in the, in the world where they are more used to warm temperatures and they have lots of air conditioning units. Here, we don't have that. So it can be a problem, two problems. One, that uh, we can be uncomfortable in our houses because either for overheating, because we are living in a, in a big city such as Birmingham, Manchester, uh, London, or also because maybe in some years time, we might need some air conditioning units, which means more electricity to power them. And then maybe the uh, electric grid couldn't cope with that, or maybe, well, we can, we can, that, I think that, that wouldn't be so much a problem, but the main problem would be that we wouldn't meet our uh, CO2 carbon targets if we start using air conditioning units. And another side effect, I would say, is air pollution. And that's becoming a more and more important problem as well. Combustion of um, um, cars, diesel cars, SUVs, um, lots of nitrogen dioxide, and in particular in cities with lots of traffic, lots of cars, it's becoming an, an issue in particular in, in, in some parts, central parts of cities, where you can see here the map of Birmingham and in the center, there are hot spots um, in parts where, where the, the maximum levels, allow, um, allowed levels are above the United Nations uh, um, levels, recommended levels. And it can be quite dangerous because it affects the, um, creates problems, respiratory problems, in particular small children. So we, we also, in, our, in, this, in the design of spaces, we also have some, uh, a huge impact also in terms of air pollution. So sustainability, uh, I think uh, I like this sentence that, that um, the concept of sustainable development was uh, described as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I think this links quite well with the built environment. How can we make cities, buildings, how can, how can we design cities and buildings that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs? Think about buildings and cities that are, that are resilient. Think about adaptability. So these are powerful con concepts and we have to make sure that every design that we do incorporates these powerful concepts. Bring here some images of things that I could think about that they've been with us for, for in this case, this, this bridge in Cordoba was built in the first century before Christ and it's still there, it's a pedestrian bridge. So these are structures that are still in use and uh, this was built almost 2000 years ago. So this powerful idea of things that we build might outlive us and, and still be standing like for future generations in centuries. Another example, this is the Pantheon in, in Rome, was built in 113 to 125. This is the building, how it looks like from the outside and from the inside, so you have both views. This was built also like centuries and centuries and centuries ago and still there. Here example from the UK, St Martin's Church in Canterbury. This is the oldest church building in Britain that is still in use and Salford Manor near Bath is thought to be the oldest occupied private house in England. So you can see the impact of what we build uh, that can, can still be with us or with, for future generations in the future. So here, a first question after all these evoking images. If you had to design cities and buildings that meet present needs without compromising the needs of the future, how would they be? 
Imagine that you are the designer. What would you do? Okay, let's give, I'm going to give you more tips and then we can, we can go back to that question later. So how can we, how can the built environment help to tackle climate change? Let's start with cities. Imagine for, uh, imagine that you want to be a planner or to work on real estate. Um, in, in, the, in the end, you'll be helping to design spaces, public spaces, spaces. Um, green, blue, uh, green spaces, blue spaces. Imagine that you design large city parks or smaller gardens. Now with COVID, we've seen the importance of having near our, near our, our homes, like green spaces, just to wander around just to, 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 to breathe some, some fresh air, how important that is. And also in terms of air pollution, we've mentioned air pollution before. Green spaces, open spaces are very important for that. And as a planner, you could have an impact in cities designing those spaces, like parks, promenades, even small gardens. Imagine that you, you want to be a landscape architect. A landscape ar architect could design also sustainable urba ur urban drainage systems. Also very, very, very important to bring like wildflowers and, and, and to the city centers. Blue spaces as well. And um, and, and why not? This is also a concept developed by planners. The 15-minute city in, par in Paris, after the COVID, they, they thought that it would be better to have uh, communities where they have all their needs covered in an area of uh, 15 minutes walking distance. Can we, can we extrapolate or import that system here to the UK? maybe to some big cities, but not to, 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 to smaller cities, but maybe it's something that we could uh, explore or if you become a planner, you could explore. And in terms of buildings, just think about buildings will have to be, we need to embed the circular economy uh, strategy, um, thinking about not the, the consumption and the, the CO2 emissions of buildings in use, but also look at the, the overall life cycle of the building from the raw material, the destruction of the materials, then the transport of the materials uh, to, the, um, um, to the manufacturing process, then the, the transport to the construction site, all the waste generated in the, in the process of construction, then the maintenance of the building, and, and after that, the end of life of the building. Um, so in, in, this, in this idea of circular economy, some ideas come as, as a way of, of mitigating some of this waste, like adaptability, repurposing, maybe reducing some structures or, or some, some buildings that are, are already there, making them more resilient. So if we make sure that they are resilient and that links with the next slide, I'm sure that most of you remember the, the fire in Grenfell Tower. Part of, of the problem was that the, the cladding selected was not selected for the, for the building being resilient. And we have to start selecting materials and structures that are resilient for the future. Otherwise, in the end, we are generating waste and we are not making buildings fit for purpose for future generations. So resilience and adaptability is very, very important. And in the end, uh, for new buildings, when you design a building, you have to be thinking about like uh, this concept of a, of a pyramid. Well, the first concept is that the cheapest energy is the one that is not consumed. So let's look at this pyramid. First, a building that is efficient, efficient building design. So we avoid any energy demand, then energy efficient equipment to save energy consumption. 
And at the top of the pyramid, using renewable energy to offset the energy consumption. So that could be like the order. But first of all, we would be looking at making uh, buildings efficient in terms of design. But as always, this is a very, we would say, wicked, complex problem. There is not an easy answer. And you can be doing something that you think it's for the greater good, like, for example, making um, buildings more energy efficient because you, you put lots of insulation and you make them air, uh, very airtight. But then you are creating unintended consequences, such as, for example, poor air quality, because now the buildings are not so drafty as the old homes. And then you have to make sure that you ventilate those buildings. Otherwise, all the viruses and also with COVID, we've seen that it's airborne. All the viruses can, can stay indoors if we don't ventilate property, pro properly. Sorry, And also overheating. If we just seal up uh, the, our buildings, then um, we are keeping the, the moisture or the uh, contaminants and also all the heat inside. So we can have also problems of overheating. Some strategies, um, I'm going to talk about these strategies now for new homes and, ex and ex existing homes. Some steps to improve the energy performance of buildings and provide health indoor environments, like an, a number of strategies for good e efficient design, efficient equipment and renewables. And on top of that, also a number of, um, of strategies to make the, the buildings also healthy, not just energy efficient. So we are saying how to make cities and buildings that are meet our needs, but also the, meet the needs of the, of the future generations, make them net zero carbon, but also provide healthy indoor environments. So things such as passive design, harnessing the power of sun, looking at, um, at ventilation strategies, making the most of thermal mass, materials that absorb, some materials uh, have the property to absorb better heat and release it. Like in a, in a um, those would be like, for example, uh, like concrete mat uh, materials similar to that. Shading solutions, maybe this is important for a warming weather. If you, for example, join or, or study any of the, of the careers in the built environment, these are um, projects that I do with my students because I teach in architectural technology, construction management. So, for example, a concept design like this, maybe an architect could, could do this concept design, but then maybe um, the, the sun path this is a project that I did with my construction management students, but maybe also an architectural technologist could do, or an architect. So it's not just being on site. There are, there are lots of things that you can do. Uh, and then we have insulation, putting very good in, uh, insulation in, in buildings, and also looking at... Um, at um, efficient windows, double glazing, triple glazing. So we have to be looking at that to make sure that our houses are uh, net zero carbon and that we don't need any extra energy to heat, to warm our homes. So if we make like the, the, the envelope uh, very, very well insulated, we would need very, not a lot of energy to warm our homes because we are keeping the warm inside. We would just need to make sure that we ventilate properly the, the house. Also, for example, details, either an architect, or this would be more like, a, like an architectural technologist looking at the, um, the drawings, the detail of how we make sure that uh, the ins where the insulation is going to be, how it's going to be installed, making sure that there are no thermal bridges, which, is, which are the parts where there can be a, a cold uh, spot or an area where, mm, to, where the thermal insulation, for example, in this case, from the roof and the thermal insulation from the fabric, where they meet in that joint, there can be an area of, of discontinuity and that's a thermal bridge 
So look at very good detail to make sure that those things are not happening. Or for example, construction managers would be on site making sure that these things don't happen. For example, here we have a thermal insulation. It's not very, very well installed. You can see that there are lots of gaps. And here they, it's, um, we are trying in, in this particular um, house, making the house very uh, well, well airtight. And you can see that some details are not well um, implemented. So if you are on site as a construction manager, you have to make sure that uh, you are controlling these things. So that's also an, a very important role because it's not just about designing, it's about installing the things correctly. These are, what I said, thermal bridges. We can see that these areas are discontinuous areas. You can see the areas marked in red or, and also avoid infiltration. This is an, an example that uh, students can also uh, do, for example, with thermal camera, we take pictures of buildings and then we monitor those buildings with um, um, heat flux plates to get the, the thermal transmittance of the fabric. Then we put that into a, if to a, if to a, so, a software where we measure the, we do like the energy simulation and then we get like the letter of the energy performance of the building. So I think this, uh, this process is quite exciting as well because then um, we can do the energy simulation of the building, but at the same time to monitor the, the real data of the building and compare if that data is the same. And for example, a building surveyor could be also be working on that, looking at the building, patholo building pathology of buildings, but also at the energy assessment of buildings. This is another uh, exercise that we did with the students. And I'm conscious about time, so I think I'm going to go a bit uh, quicker from now on. So yeah, uh, also efficient equipment and renewables. Here also some work from, from the students looking at um, a photovoltaic arrays and all the calculation. And then as I said also, it's important to have health indoor environments, looking at materials that, that have low emissions monitoring the indoor conditions, looking at the temperature, humidity, nitrogen dioxide, CO2 levels that um, they build up quite a lot when, when there are people inside and they are a very good indication of ventilation. They're used quite a lot now with COVID. If the CO2 levels grow over 800, 1000, means that that space is not well ventilated. And also it can be more problematic in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the, the virus transmission. Uh, these are some monitoring exercises that we do also with students monitoring the houses and looking at how the, the values, for example, from gas burn stoves, how the nitrogen dioxide levels grow when we are um, cooking, like for example, a Sunday roast or whatever. So very interesting exercises that we do with the students, but we also do that as part of our research in the university and things that you could do as well if you join any of the built environment careers. So again, if you have, we, we bring back, back again this question, if you had to design a building that meets uh, present needs without compromising the needs of the future, how would it be? This is an example from the um, Climate Change Committee of how would it look like a house, low carbon sustainable home for existing homes and new build homes. And it has some of the things that we've um, uh, mentioned already in terms of good insulation, low carbon heating, um, highly water efficient devices, green spaces, flood resilience. I've been talking about fire resilience, but also flood resilience is very important. And then the same with exist with new built homes. But let's look at you and then maybe you can just type in the chat, which one do you, do you think um, 
is your favorite choice. So now it's your turn. You are the designers. Which one of these, I'm going to show you four examples. Which one would you choose as your candidate for being the most efficient net zero carbon building? Which one do you think that you would be designing? This is the Earthship. This house is in Brighton, it's off grid. It has all tires, adobe and timber, a passive solar design, wind solar PV, solar thermal, is used in wood for burning, for heating uh, the, the house, and it's located in nature. So this is candidate one. Let's go for candidate two. It's a more modern and fashion house with lots of PV panels, heat pumps, is, it has heat recovery technologies. It uses wood pellets like biomass for heating, lots of smart controls, etc. So this is the second example. Third example, we have the smart prefab house. So it's a prefabricated house with modern methods of construction. It's, it's been built off-site and then mm, uh, put inside on, on the site. So low waste, good detailing, efficient use of materials, high building quality, and correctly sized technology properly installed and commissioned. And then we have the last example, which is an existing house that has been retrofitted. So we are recycling, reusing, adapting an existing house. Uh, um, it's been designed, designed using passive house, so it has low demand, uh, lots of harnessing the power of sun, solar power, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, and daylight tubes. So this is the fourth example. So I would like you to, to interact and, and tell us which one do you think that you would be designing or is the most uh, effective net zero carbon design. And I'm going to, find, find, uh, to um, finalize my, my, my presentation with just a couple of slides of professions in the built environment that can make, how can we make a change in the built environment? The global building stock will do double by area in 2060. And to accommodate this tremendous gro growth, we expect like 230 billion square meters of new floor area, which is quite a lot. And this new building stock must be designed to meet, to meet net zero carbon standards. And on top of that, we have lots of existing homes that have to be retrofitted as well. So, and this is my last, last slide, careers, great potential of careers in the built environment, 6% to 7% um, of the, the contribution of the to the UK economy. And there are lots of opportunities because there are there are many of the current workforce are due to retire in the next 10 years. And when nationally we need some um, 700,000 recruits. So quite a lot every year to keep pace with those that are leaving the industry. So many thanks, as I said, um, lots of in the, in the built environment. I hope that you found this presentation interesting and thank you very much.